Richard, uh, thank you so much for coming to talk to me about your novel, The Overstory. It is my absolute pleasure. <laughs> we are sat, very fittingly, I think, under a gorgeous tree, uh, an oak tree. That's right, Cecil Oak, an enormous one. It seems a very fitting place to sit here and talk about your novel, which is very much about trees, and I think so much about trees, actually, that it almost pushes the human characters into a different perspective. We'll come back to that later. Um, I wanted to ask first about structure. Um, your novels often have a structure which is influenced by the theme or the content of the book, and I think very strongly so in this case. Could you tell us a little bit about how this novel is structured and, and why you chose to do it in that way? It is in four sections. Uh, roots, trunk, crown, and seeds. I didn't have that structure when I set out. I was going to try to take my nine characters and tell a straightforward chronological story and just cross-cut between them based on what was happening when. And uh, at the end of a, a rather gargantuan first draft, I realized that's going to be tough going for a reader to keep track of so many protagonists uh, who are, are just introduced uh, by whatever event happens to be happening in a given uh, year. So I went back and, and separated these stories so that all the back uh, backstories for each character uh, were independent and that the reader could get to know each character slowly, almost as in a series of short stories uh, for, for, a, for a grand, uh, gigantic overture, if you will, uh, before they began to come together into the principal drama of the story. When I stood back from that and looked at, at what I had, I realized that there was a wonderful structural analogy to a tree. What I had were nine independent roots coming up into a shared uh, stem. When that, uh, when that shared story reaches a kind of catastrophic moment uh, and the characters are uh, propelled outward again into their own uh, separate lives, that became my, my crown. And at the very end, the long-term unforeseen consequences of their actions throughout this great process uh, rain back down again and produce uh, the seeds of hope or possibility uh, that carry the, the, the story forward beyond the last page of the book. Mm. I mentioned earlier about how the, the sort of the, the, the prominence of trees actually pushes the human characters into a different perspective. We're very used to reading fiction about people where they are the central character. Right. And whilst you do have your protagonists in this book, and we, as you say, we do get to know them all very well through right. that opening section of the book, the perspective is shifted by the, the lifetime of trees. No, it's interesting that you mentioned that time element. I mean, there are parts of the book that function almost like a, like a time-lapse film. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the opening stories has to do with taking a picture a month for uh, uh, several decades mm. of one enormous chestnut. And the family story is just kind of flickering around in the foreground of this great tree that's unfolding on an entirely different frame of time. I, this book is about taking the non-human seriously. It's about realizing that we are not alone on this earth and the rest of creation is not there simply to be a resource to us. So what I ended up doing was creating a, a kind of dramatic stage where the lives of the humans and the lives of these enormous, slow-moving, complicated, social, uh, ingenious, uh, non-human protagonists could for a while uh, meet in the same dramatic moment. Uh, but it did require, as you say, kind of cross-cutting back and forth between a recognizable social story and a biological story uh, that makes the social story possible, mm. but is also on the, on the brink of becoming something else uh, at the hands of the social. Uh, but finding a way of, of having those two completely different kinds of agents and, and, and creatures uh, defining each other, uh, reciprocally connecting to each other. In each of your novels there is often a piece of science that blows my mind <laughs> and you have something in, in the overstory which I found absolutely fascinating which is this idea of trees communicating with each other uh, in order to, to form social protection really against yeah. predators and, and yeah. disease and things like that. Could you tell us a bit more about that because it really is extraordinary. This is research that's come on in the last few decades that has completely changed the way that we think about forests and trees. And uh, you've already hinted at, at the nature. Uh, it's now 
very well established that trees signal to each other over the air. They, they come together to form collaborative immune systems. Uh, they, they warn each other of infestation. Uh, they're, they're also deeply connected underground in mycorrhizal connections with fungus. And you know, the discovery that trees uh, feed and heal each other, uh, that they keep their, their young and their sick alive, uh, has changed not only our understanding of the society of trees, but the nature of Darwinian evolution. Once you discover that a Douglas fir can be feeding and nurturing a, a birch, <laughs> you think about the green world in a different way. And that same kind of interdependence, that same kind of reciprocity, of course, has always and will always include human beings. We just have to come to realize it and, <laughs> and to, to join uh, this story that we've separated ourselves from artificially and wrongly. Uh, researching the book and writing it has had quite a profound effect on you and your life, hasn't it? I, I, I was living uh, in Palo Alto, in Silicon Valley in Northern California, uh, when I got the tree bug, and I got it from the redwoods on the, uh, on the mountains above uh, Silicon Valley in the Santa Cruz Mountains, the second growth redwood forest up there. Um, but I then went through this multi-year process of realizing that I had walked through the world in a kind of waking dream without actually seeing the neighbors. And, uh, as my obsession grew, and I, I ended up reading over 120 books about trees, you know, single, uh, single volume studies about trees, not to mention many more times that in articles. Uh, I just, you know, I, I, I was obsessed with traveling, seeing, learning, and I kept reading about uh, what an old growth forest uh, looked like and how rare they are. I mean, I, I was stunned to discover that between 95 and 98 percent of uh, the original forests of North America that were present when Europeans arrived are gone. And to see that remaining few percent, the books kept saying, you have to go uh, to the uh, southern Appalachia, to the, to the Smoky Mountains, uh, where, where a, a large percentage of the remnant eastern broadleaf forests uh, uh, still exist. I went down there three years ago as a research project and I instantly felt like I had never been so well or so happy just being in a place. And I bought a house and I moved down there and I've been living down there ever since. And this book has been out for a while and I don't see myself moving. I just, uh, it's changed not only where I live but how I live. It's changed the, the pace and the tempo of my days. When I was reading your novel, I happened to meet and interview the um, theoretical physicist Carlo Rovelli. Oh, right. And he saw what I was reading and he asked me what it was and what it was about and I explained and mentioned the tree connection. And he said that um, when he gets very nervous before delivering a lecture, which you wouldn't know watching any of his lectures, um, he will take himself outside and he will go to a huge tree and he will talk to it and he will find that incredibly calming and helps him to sort of see things in perspective right. and then he's filled with the confidence to go and address right. that room of people. What do you think that is? There's something that psychologists call species loneliness. This horrific sense that there is no meaning outside of us and we're the only game in town. Mm. We're the only interesting prospect and that's a terrifying thing. I think when Ravelli goes outside and sits by that tree and talks to it, he's defeating species loneliness. Right. He's saying, there is a meaning so far beyond me, and there is a, a, a frame of connectivity so much larger and so much longer than I am, I don't have to worry anymore. I'm out there, you know? I'm, I'm in, implicated into processes that, that that are so liberating to understand. I'm just a tiny bit of this experiment and the experiment goes on and on and on. Richard, it was a, such a pleasure to read your book, but even more of a pleasure to take the time to talk to you about it. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Will.